forward. Sorry. So thanks, Mike. Uh, and we're going to um, kind of just refresh people as far as what the Mishnah itself, what Perkei Avot tells us. At the very beginning, we started with this line that Moses received the Torah at Sinai, gave it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, the prophets to the men of great assembly, and they said three things. Be patient in administration of justice, raise many disciples, and make a fence around the Torah. And that is our first line. Every line in this is a saying from a rabbi, or in this case, a group of people who transmit their, their, um, their, their wisdom. This is like the sayings of Confucius in the, in the sense that these are sayings that are collected. Uh, we don't believe that Confucius, said, one person said all of the sayings of Confucius. Some of these sayings are um, contradictory to each other. But almost every one of them is filled with a truth, and in some cases a very profound truth, that is transcendent of, 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 of even Judaism, in the sense that it's wisdom that many people uh, could derive uh, strength and um, inspiration and, and guidance from, and quite frankly, is as relevant today as it was when it was written. There is virtually not a line, maybe there's a couple lines, that are kind of like archaic and you go, that, that really doesn't make sense now. But almost every line in here is as relevant today as it was written 2,000 years ago. So there's not many places where you can, where you can look at that and mm-hmm. say, well, well, what's the historical context of this? Well, yeah, these were written by men. They were written by Jewish men who lived primarily around 2,000 years ago. Again, before and after the time of Jesus, some of these people would have been contemporaries with Jesus. The sayings and the the ideas that are here, some of them, according to some Christians, influenced Jesus. Uh, Some Jews also say that this kind of thing influenced Jesus and his followers. I'm not exactly sure if that's the case. Um, Um. but there are sayings that Jesus had, that are attributed to Jesus at least, that sound like the kinds of things that somebody would would have asked or or would have been put out there because, as we'll see, the rabbis say certain things like this. So when people pose the question to Jesus and he gives a, a profound answer, a lot of these are the similar things that, that we have in Pirkei Avot. So it is around the same time, and um, there are people who have done comparisons between not just per Kavot, but parts of the Mishnah and parts of the Christian Bible too. So there are there are books that have compared rabbinic literature, uh, the Talmud primarily in Midrash versus what's in the Christian Bible. So uh, we read the first few lines of this, and and um, it does follow hi- a, a historical um, um, lineage, and so it starts off with with the people that we got it from. We did point out, by the way yesterday, and we talked about it a little bit last week too, it's interesting because when it gives us this transmission, this legacy of transmission, the priests aren't mentioned. And we read in Ezekiel just yesterday that Ezekiel essentially remind, or God reminds the priests that they're the ones who are supposed to help teach the people what to do. And here, they're just not even mentioned. And, and we feel that that's a little bit reflective of what was going on at the time, which is a transfer of of power and authority from the priests to the rabbis. The, the, The rivalry between the Pharisees and the Sadducees we know about now historically from Josephus, because we read Josephus now and we know that they didn't get along. We get little indications of it from the rabbis themselves, but the rabbis are actually interesting in the sense that they don't give us the full picture of how much they were at odds with the priests. And I think they do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, they don't really want us to... They, they, they are very clear that Jewish rivalries and Jewish civil strife is, is, was bad. They actually say that's what caused the, de- the temple to be destroyed during the Roman era, was it was the hatred and the fighting that was going on amongst the Jews that was the responsibility, the reason why the temple was destroyed. But they're not very specific about it. 
And they very rarely will point fingers at individuals who are responsible within the community or even parties for that matter. So while they talk a little bit about King Herod, for example, in the rabbinic literature, he's not talked about a lot. Um, the priests who were very corrupt, I mean, based on what Josephus said, who was a priest, was from a priestly family, who was a Kohen, uh, what the rabbis said in the Mishnah, what the Romans kind of tell us, the priests were really corrupt during the Roman era. But the rabbis don't really slam them too, too much. So I think it's partly because they didn't want to air the dirty laundry in, in specifically ways. Yeah. Weren't the folks corrupt too? Oh, yeah. Anybody who has that kind of power, it's that kind of power and wealth is corrupting. And, and for, the, for the Jewish community, the priesthood became the seat of, of so much wealth that it was almost impossible. What happened during that time, just to remind people, during the time that this was written, during the time of the Mishnah, during, right before the temple was destroyed, what would happen is priests would go to the Romans and say, look, if you make me priest, if you allow me to take priestly authority, we'll give you a cut of, you know, $700,000, whatever the, you know, the drachma equivalent would be. And it was millions. And they would literally say, you know, look, we'll split it 20, 80. I'll split it 30, 70 with you. Just make me the priest. There was so much money there that, that they would outbid each other. And so one priest would take power and then another priest would go to the Romans and say, I'll give you even a better cut if you make me priest. And they would just constantly do this with the Romans so that they were, they were like 10 priests in the last three or four years before the temple was destroyed because they just kept offing each other and getting the Romans to essentially put them in charge. So it was a completely corrupt. It was even, again, I don't know if it's worse than the popes, but it was really, really bad. So much so that I think to a certain extent, the people were not sad to see the, the priestly cult gone. I didn't want to see the temple destroy those people, but they might have said, we don't like that system. And it's, again, there was so much money that, like, if somebody says to you, well, I'm going to give you $10 million, and you go, you know, I'll, I'll keep a million and give you $9 million, people said that, and, they, and, they, and the priests did that. They, they were like, that's so much money that I, I don't need all of it. I'll give, I'll give it to the Romans. So it was a very bad system. And so the Romans capitalized on that. They took advantage of it. And the rabbis didn't talk that much about it, but we know it happened. And Josephus reported it. And, and when we have Josephus' text now that we study, we, we see how bad it was. Because he, he, he was there. He was a reporter of it to some extent. And he was a priest himself. So he knew what was happening. Everybody knew what was happening. The rabbis, though, didn't report it that much. That's my main point. On the other hand, they're not giving the priests any credit here for being transmis transmitters uh, and being on this line of transmission. So um, it is interesting that they don't get a lot of credit, but at the same time, the rabbis are 100% envisioning that one day the temple will be restored and there will be priests again. So it's not like they're looking for a time when the priests wouldn't come back. They just didn't want it to be like it had been. And I think to some extent, let the priests do their job, and then we'll do our job of, of educating and, and keeping the community together. But again, some of the rabbis were priests themselves. Some of them were very knowledgeable about the priesthood. And, you know, the, the, the rabbis weren't trying to do away with it. But at the same time, they realized how corrupt it was. Were there priests in the great assembly? Yeah. Yeah. These people were... these. Priests, these people who, like Shimon HaTzadik, he was a priest. So these people, you know, like Shimon says, one of the three things, right? Al Shlosha Devarim Ha'olam Omed, the song that we sing. Al Shlosha Devarim. This is from here. Al HaTorah Al HaAvodah Al Gmilut HaSadim. He says it stands on Torah. It stands on the priestly service, the temple service, and on acts of piety. But one of the three things is the temple. So definitely early on, and he's early. He's like from the 300s, 250 BC. He's early. But as we go through this time, as we said, we get we get Roman. who are living under the Roman authority, and they have Roman names. I mean, this guy Antigonus, he's a rabbi. He studied under Shimon, and he already has a Greco-Roman name. Uh, some of them have a name where their dad was Greek, and they have a Hebrew name. So we see guys who 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 have. Uh, Antigonus 
we know where he came from, but we don't know his father's name. So sometimes we know what the person's uh, last name was, for example, or, you know, his, 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 uh, patronomic, you know, his, his, uh, his dad's name, his family name. And sometimes we know where they're from. Um, and sometimes we just know them by their first name. Why? Because everybody knew them by their first name. And we're going to see one of those guys in a second. So one of the things we also read last week where we kind of finished up, here's uh, Yossi ben Yochanan. It says from Jerusalem. We know his father, where his father, and he says also where, where he was from. Uh, this is where we finished off with, which was get for yourself this part from Yoshua ben Parachia. Uh, appoint for yourself a teacher, acquire for yourself a companion, and judge all men with the scale weighted in their favor. Uh, and this is a, a, a great line for, for the rabbis to remember, because again, and a lot of them are threefold. A lot of them are this one, this one, and this one, the rule of three, right? The law of three from uh, Star Trek. You have to have three things, right? You know, the two people that you know, and then one that you've never heard of, right? That's the from the future. Um, but no, this is, this is the, uh, these are the three things that he's got. Get a good Rav, get for yourself a teacher, get for yourself a companion, a Chaver, and then judge all people with, uh, with the, with the, with the, with the scale weighted in their favor. So assume that they're not guilty first. We're going to see things that contradict that, by the way, to some extent there, there are lines here that we actually you're going to see there are other rabbis who don't say that but this is kind of you could say maybe a little bit you know don't judge somebody until you you uh think about maybe their circumstances but again not every rabbi is going to say that but we did say one of the things that is really really important is to have a haver now that doesn't just mean a friend that is not a um that is not what they're talking about here, like you and I have a buddy. Um, this is this is something a little bit more serious than that. And this is uh, what we're talking about. I will show you. Um, it's um, something that's very important in our in our community. And it's something that is still done around, we mentioned around Jewish uh, academies around the world. It's what we call Chavruta study. So here's Chaverim, right? Same words, friends, but it's not. It's a study partner. And this is what we call Chavruta study. This, by the way, is this is going on in the Yeshiva Gadola in Carteret in, in New Jersey. This is going on in New Jersey right now. You just think it's all about going down to the Jersey Shore. These kids are not going to the Jersey Shore. These guys are studying head to head. You see that? Now, these guys here on the front, I'm not sure why they're not. Uh, there's a guy here, though, that's not in the picture. You can see these two. These two guys are not sitting across from each other. I don't know if this guy wasn't or I don't know why they're they're not. But all these other guys are sitting across from each other. And the reason is, is that's the way you study in, in Beit Midrash. Side side or... Sit opposite. Yeah, but you're you're really supposed to sit opposite the person. And, and it, back in the day, it's because you shared a book. Nowadays, everybody has their own book. But back in the day when you had to share a book, the, you, would, you would literally have it, and they would turn it back and forth, and they'd go back and forth. This is what's depicted in the movie Yentl, which, of course, everybody forgets because it's a love story, and it, they, didn't, they, they didn't do a deep dive into Chavruta's study. But it is that kind of very, very deep um, uh, relationship, which is one of the things that... that uh, Isaac Bashev Singer wanted to get through mm -hmm. to people is the relationships that people had would sometimes border on mm -hmm. intimate love. It really did. And so people would get into this relationship where they spent so much time with someone, they were so deeply involved with them. And, the, and you had a, you had a, um, you had a, a relationship that was also based on responsibility because you had to know the text so that your partner could also go back and forth with you. And, and argue about it and discuss it and try to sharpen each other. And so this was this was a, a basis for study and, and for centuries and, and still is in, in the yeshivas. It really is a, a wonderful way to study. And there are other groups now. I know that some of um, the schools in Korea and some other groups in, in Asia where they have a very kind of independent, um, uh, very competitive, I would say, uh, study system, they're starting to wonder if maybe that's not the best way 
And in Korea, you know, you have kids that study all night and they go to tutoring and they, they stay up all night, but they're, they're, they don't ever have a relationship and they don't have this type of, of um, engagement. And they, and they think that this type of study actually helps people retain the information better because rather than just like temporary absorbing it, they, they, people feel that they have to really be engaged in it. It really, they learn it in a different way because they also have to teach it. They have to be, be sure that they can defend it. And so um, this is, uh, uh, many people think, one of the, the, the more elevated ways of, of really taking on a study. So this is, what the, this is what he's talking about. He's not just talking about a friend. I think people sometimes miss the power of, of what that is. And just so you know, it's not just dudes that study like this anymore because in the Orthodox world, we also have women that are now studying um, in uh, Chavruta. These are Orthodox women that are now studying texts. Uh, and so there are a lot of uh, women's yeshivas and women's uh, groups that are now uh, uh, teaching and, and helping women engage in this type of study too. So you don't have to be yentl anymore in order to do this. She couldn't. That's why she had to do it. It's right. So now you have women that are doing it. And it's a wonderful, wonderful way to study. Uh, it's not necessarily ultra Orthodox. It's, it's, it, well, let's put it this way in the ultra Orthodox yeshivas, it is all Hebrew to study, but you don't have to be ultra Orthodox to study that way. Oh, women? No, no. Uh, the ultra Orthodox are still not studying that like that. The one that has the Radbury in between. Uh, the women, the women are um, the women are. That's more modern Orthodox uh, women yeah, that, that are staying. Back. Yeah, well, that gets back to the part that we read last week, which I skipped over. But thank you. Not, not, not. To, not don't talk to too much the to women. To too much. Uh, it was. It was mainly. It was. Yeah, Gloria is was on. Uh, she's still on. So, yes, this was not the best line. This was maybe one of the more archaic lines. Though I will tell you that it does depict a time when we were fully, and we fully admitted that men would be distracted by women. Um, nowadays, it's not politically correct to say that, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Uh, and. And I guess that was one of the lessons from Yentl is that he he fell in love. But actually part of the essence of that story, the story, not necessarily the movie, was that it could have happened even if it was a guy. So that was, uh, it's in the movie, but it's really in the story. Um, but yeah, the, the, the energy that women would take away from the guy who was studying was a legitimate issue. Uh, and so that is something that's discussed in, 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 um, in yeshivas now, and especially in the ultra orthodox world, is that they have people have to balance their family life with their with their studies. But you know, it's uh, it is difficult for some guys to um, to balance that. And sometimes their teachers will tell them, you know, you need to spend more time with your family. So it does happen. I mean, it was a little bit in that in that unorthodox uh, television show. They showed a little bit about that. But um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, it is a part of of people's lives when, especially when they're younger men and, and they are not yet married, that um, that this would be a problem. Um, but it does say again, you know, even if it's your wife, it's also um, it's also an issue. But again, it's also to prevent um, adultery. So almost all of these laws are to, as we said before, right at the beginning, put a fence around the Torah. Siag la Torah. How to put a fence around the Torah so that we don't violate the laws. So uh, that's what we read. So let's read a little bit, a little bit new stuff today. Uh, and we are going to get into some very famous rabbis. Some of the people that we've read about so far we really don't know much about them because it's almost they're almost like mythic characters. As we get closer to around 200, 100, um, to the rabbis that are mentioned many times in, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, then when they start, these people, we have a little bit of bio on them. Uh, we know a little bit about them, and we even know where some of them are buried. 
So we have uh, we have uh, caves where some of the rabbis are buried. I don't spend a lot of time when we go to Israel. People know this. I don't spend a lot of time taking people to to graves. There are people who, when they go to Israel, that's all they do is go to graves. So just so you know, uh, the city of Tiberias, all around Tiberias, this is where many of these rabbis are buried. Judah Hanasi is buried um, in that Galilee area. Many of these rabbis, um, their graves are, are venerated. People know where they are. People have been visiting them for thousands of years. Venerated. And they people go there. We are not sure exactly in Hebron, for example, where Abraham is buried. There were legends about where Hebron was, uh, where the cave of Machpelah was for Abraham. Uh, and we assume that those are the places, but we don't know exactly, and we can't. We can't find. We can't. We can't um, do any excavations there because we can't disturb the bodies. The rabbis' burial places. We're pretty sure. Again, can't excavate it, but we're pretty sure that that's where where um, where they are. It's they are not biblical. They're, these are people who live two thousand years later, after you know, seventeen hundred years after Abraham, twelve hundred years after uh, Moses. It's a long time, and so these people pretty sure where they're buried. Um, but we can't disturb their bodies. We can't do DNA testing. We can't do any of that. But um, we're pretty sure where some of these people are buried. So um, so the two people that we mentioned, a lot of these people are going to be in what we call pairs, uh, zugot. Uh, they come in pairs. So they'll give one of the per person's line, the one person's line, and then they'll give the other person's line. So they gave Yehoshua's line, and now this is Natai, who is from Arbel. That was the place that he was from. Natai, the Arbelite, used to say, keep a distance from an evil neighbor. Do not become attached to the wicked and do not abandon faith in divine retribution. Um, this is uh, an interesting phrase. Uh, of course, again, we have uh, three things. Uh, but they kind of cover some some uh, some some ground here because some of them are are very well. The first two you could argue are really about relating with uh, other humans, other people, and then the last one really is uh, a tough one because it's a it's a theological principle, and we will get some theological one principles here. <laughs> this is one of them. This idea of divine retribution, right? That there is a, that there is, um, that there is something that is yeah, balanced yeah. out by God. No. Yeah. Okay. So, the the other two are pretty kind of, they're kind of self-explanatory. Yeah, and then the other one here though is a, is a, um, is a tough one to wrap your head around because. Careful. How how is somebody going to um how is somebody going to how are they going to give up on this idea? How are they going to give up on on divine retribution? Well, I guess it's kind of easy if you think about the fact that some people um have seen things in their lives where it doesn't seem to make sense. And so because they, the things that they see don't make sense. They give up on the idea that there is any type of justice, at least a justice that will be um, administered if in the human world it doesn't get, um, it doesn't come down. So this is, I, I think it's a pretty profound idea, but it's one that people will definitely say, well, that's kind of a theological argument. That's not just you know, as simple as saying, this is, you know, stay away from bad people. Okay, I get it. That's probably pretty sound advice, pretty simple advice. Uh, it's not always easy to do, but it's easy to say. But the last one's a tough one because mm -hmm. it is very easy to not have faith that there's going to um, be divine retribution because we may not get to see it. Yes, if you don't get to see it, how do you know that it happened? Mm -hmm. So this is where um, we get into some pretty um, pretty powerful ideas, and we start to also see what the rabbis believe, because they believe that there is retribution that could happen after you die. The priests don't believe that. 
I wonder. The, the Kohanim don't believe that. They believe that everything is uh, done by God and it is done by God. There's, we're going to see it happen in our I lifetimes. Some, so th you, what do I believe? It doesn't matter what I believe. I guess it does. No, it doesn't. I'm asking. Doesn't, doesn't matter what I believe. I Listen, if I tell you, again, this is my belief, that's only that's only the um that's only what I, I I first of all there's nothing I can prove. So people ask me all the time. I I uh will tell you that it does I can't tell you uh, I can't give anybody any more assurance that 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 principle of divine retribution is true um in 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 a, in a way that 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 I can understand or or prove um, that would make any difference. So it's not that I'm avoiding answering the question, but what difference does it make? Where I, what what does it what what does it matter? But in the end, Joanne, what what does it matter? What I believe, honestly. Because you believe in the rabbi, you should believe in what he's saying. Okay, so Ken, Harvey, what did you say? <laughs> Harvey, say what you said out loud again. <laughs> If we believe you as the rabbi and we follow you, we should believe what you believe in. I, I don't. Or at least I, I, have I a good I, idea of what I, you Har believe. Harvey, in. Harvey, listen. Yeah, that's not so. that. That that is. First of all, but I'm telling you, I'm I'm telling you, that's exactly what I would. What I'm trying to tell you is I. But I have no proof of anything that I tell you because if it. Republican or Democrat, I'm only asking you would you believe in this. That, but the only point is it's a belief. So if I tell you what I believe, I I can't. If I could tell you I know for a fact that this is what happens, then I would tell you. But of course I can't. So so therefore, if I tell you what my thoughts on it are or my belief is on it, then all I can tell you is this is what <laughs> this is what. Well, first of all, at some point I also have to rationally. I also have to say. Am I hoping that this is what it is, or because because the, at the end of the day, what people really are asking for is some kind of vindication or some kind of proof that what I'm going to tell you is true, and I don't have it. So to a, to ask me to ask me to give you what I can't give you, I feel like it's not fair because I can't. So if I say, well, I believe this this and this and this happened, and somebody says, well, well how do you know that? They say, well, I believe that. Well, do you believe it because you know that? The, I mean, I, no, because I believe it. If I knew it, then I wouldn't say I believe it anymore. I would say, I know this is what happens. So if I said, for example, I know that there's an afterlife, and I say, I don't believe it. I know for a fact that there's an afterlife. Then people would say, okay, well, he's got proof. He somehow, he knows for a fact that this is what's going to happen. So I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I, I don't have... Proof, and so I wouldn't say this is this is what what my proof is. My my judgment, my my hope, my belief, my faith is one thing. But I I it doesn't like I would say that that in a simple answer, my faith is that that this existence that we see here is not the only existence. But I don't have any proof of that. So at the end of it. I understand, but you're not going to say, "Hey, he told me there was something happening." <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I, well, if that was the case, then then I'm right. But, but I have no proof. And so, if if somebody said, "Hey, prove to me that there's that there's another existence," I would say this: it based on like what I know from existence and from science, I don't think that things. The conservation of mass and the conservation of energy principle leads me to believe that that nothing can really be gone because if it's here, then it's it can't be nothing afterwards. So, for people to say there's a finality of of a, of a lack of existence anymore of somebody, then I, I I don't that that is a harder principle for me to accept than than there is something else because I just my my logical mind says. That there's that there's a conservation of mass and energy. So that, that's if it changes. I mean, that's different, by the way. I do believe that people have memories and people have that kind of stuff. But anyways, that's my that's my simple answer on it. But it's not it's not a it's not something that 
like I said, I have proof for, and it's not something that I would say is a um, anything other than a belief. Because I don't have proof. I have no proof. So uh, this is, but this is what the rabbi said. What? You got 80 proof? Um, but it, so that was Natai. Uh, that's what Natai said. So Yoshua's lines are are all kind of in this world. This one a little bit a little bit beyond because some of this has to do with with God, um, and you'll see some of them are, and some of them really aren't. And I I would say that most of the 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 lines, especially in the first couple of chapters, are not about are not about principles that you have to have faith in. I would say. John. Yeah. The Thai, the Arbalite, or the rabbi? Yeah. All of these people are rabbis. So, John, uh, not only are we studying for our Bible, mm -hmm. but we're, we're engaging in critical thinking. Yep. Right? So, my, my question is what is wrong with keeping the distance from the old man? You hear that? Right. So John's saying, what's wrong with these things? Yep. And then, do not abandon faith in divine retribution, meaning, meaning it's, if you do these things, their actions will be corrected or, or attended to. Yeah, but, but, but yes. So that's where you have to have faith that, number one, there's a God, and number two, that there's a God who cares about this world that will fix this stuff, that there's an accountability with God. Yes. So the last one is a, is a faith proposition. The other two are not, is what I'm saying. And the last one is, we haven't really seen many faith propositions so far. Actually, I don't know if any of these have been faith propositions so far. Not really. Oh, actually, this one is. Uh, if he neglects study, he'll he'll inherit Gehonim, which is Gehenom, which is going to hell, essentially. So that that's a little bit belief in, in in the world to come. Uh but yes, they did. The rabbis will get will get into this. They actually say flat out you have to have a belief in the world to come. But for the most part, what we're going to read in the first two chapters does not require uh belief in faith propositions. And as I said, faith propositions that not every Jew believed in. The Sadducees did not believe in a hell. They didn't believe in it. I mean and, and it became Look, did every Sadducee not believe in hell? I don't know. But what separated the Sadducees from the Pharisees, what they would get in arguments about, according to Josephus, for example, was that one party believed in an afterlife and one of them didn't. And so the rabbis will put out stuff about the afterlife, including in, in Pirkei Avot, to kind of articulate the differences and to say, look, we don't believe like, like these people did. So, for example, the Essenes, we don't know that the Essenes, who seem to be a, maybe a little bit a little bit like an offshoot of the Sadducees, we don't know that they believed in a heaven or hell. Like, we don't know. There weren't a lot, but there were, there were enough that Josephus wrote about them as a third group. So let's say the Pharisees were the biggest, then the Sadducees and the Essenes, and then the Zealots at the end. The, the, those are the four groups that he mentions. And there probably were many others, but those were the four largest groups. The Essenes are the third largest group, and, and probably had thousands of followers, even people who didn't live like them. There are people who believed it and supported them that they were doing the right thing. Some people say that John the Baptist was Essene. Some people say that Jesus was, you know, influenced by the Essenes. Uh, but we, we don't know, because the Essenes seemed a little bit more into the temple and a little bit more into cultic issues than Jesus seemed to be. So if Jesus was you know, if John the Baptist was, um, then then um, by the time that Jesus and his followers were, they didn't seem to care that much about the temple. So they don't they they don't seem to care about it. The rabbis do care about the temple. I want to make it very clear. They cared a lot about the temple. I'll show you at the end of the six of the six sections of the of the Mishnah. Two of them. Two of them, two whole books. One third of the Mishnah is about the temple. Yeah, but they still kept all those laws and all those texts, and and it's there, it's not just in those last two books. It's in other parts of the of the Mishnah. Talk about 
the temple. So they, they weren't expecting the temple not to be rebuilt. But yes, so Nittai deals with this, this, this faith proposition, which we'll see occasionally, but, but not always. So Because look at the other. The next two zugot, the next two pairs are, are Judah, Yehuda ben Tabai, and Shimon ben Shatach. They received the tradition from them. And that's what we're starting to see now, too, that these pairs teach other the next generation. Judah ben Tabai said, do not as a judge, which it doesn't say as a judge, but based on the context, play the part of the advocate. When the litigants are be, be standing before you, in front of you, look upon them as if they are both guilty. When they leave your presence, look on them as if, as if they were both innocent, when they have accepted the judgment. So it says when they leave, not just to think that they're innocent, but when they have accepted the judgment, and they walk out of the trial, and they understand the consequences, then they're, then they're both innocent. They've both been vindicated. So what's interesting about this is it shows us, first of all, that the rabbis did function as, as judges. They, they, they functioned as judges, and to some extent, probably also sometimes functioned as advocates, as lawyers. And here, it's telling you that when you're the judge, don't play the part of the advocate. Don't be the attorney. Your job is to hear the arguments. Your job is not to say, well, if I was defending this guy, this is what I would do. No, nope. you have to be there as the judge, not as an attorney anymore. And, and that's hard sometimes for judges to do because they were, in some cases, attorneys for a long time. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they, they kind of want to be a judge and they don't really want to be attorneys, but they all studied. They all studied to be judges. They, I mean, to be, all studied to be lawyers. Nobody just goes and suddenly is a judge. They, they spend some time in law school. And, uh, and, and what this is telling us is when the, the rabbis are functioning as judges, they're not supposed to see themselves as the advocates uh, on behalf of the plain, plaintiff or, or, again, for, I wouldn't necessarily say they're always civil situa um, you know, criminal is, is situations. Sometimes they're civil. There's two parties that come before you. One says, this is my goat, and the other one says, this is my goat. And, and they fight over whose goat it is. They're... they're the the assumption that he's saying is that assume both parties are lying to you, which is what Judge Judy does all the time. Well, she's a good Jewish judge. She assumes they're both lying, and she makes them prove that the, 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 what they're saying is true. It's a great way of being a judge. It's not what you do if you're a lawyer. If you're a lawyer, you defend your client. That's what the law is. When you walk into that room, the law assumes one thing for sure. Yes. So we, we sometimes talk about the presumption of innocence in this country. That's not always been the case in every legal system around the world. So we also, in many cases, are not talking about criminal cases. We're talking about civil cases where two people are coming before you and you have to figure out who, which, person is, which person is telling the truth. And of course, in some cases, they're just, they're just sometimes they're lying and sometimes they just don't know the, the rules. But assuming that they're they're both telling a story, you assume that both of them are going to tell the story that benefits them. And so your job as a, as a judge is not to start trying to find um, or, or assume that either one of them is telling the truth. Look, one of the ways the rabbis have explained this passage in particular is this way. If when they first come before you, don't assume that one of them is telling the truth and one of them isn't telling the truth. Assume they're both not telling the truth. Because to assume that one of them is telling the truth means that you come in with a preconceived notion that one of them either because of their wealth or their lack of wealth or their position or their job, whatever, is going to be more apt to tell the truth. And they're basically saying, don't do that. Now, the last part or second part of it, which is to, to assume that these people are now innocent, is to take into consideration that once the verdict has been given, that everything is equal now. Now they're equal. So Judaism doesn't really say the scales or the person holding the scales, whether or not they're, whether the justice is blind, but, but when justice is, is given out, it, it levels, it levels the, the field, right? It levels the scales. It, it's now making it balanced. It's in balance now. So what the job of the court to do is, is to, is to find a balance. And so we sometimes say, 
Well, that, that involves justice, right? That involves administering justice, but it also means making sure that in we're in the in and as we're administering justice, we're not creating a situation where we're further um messing up the balance. And so if you in, invoke, for example, a very steep penalty on somebody, you haven't made the, the situation necessarily fair. You've actually now caused there to be an imbalance in making the other person now suffer um, too much. And so you've made it worse. So you've made the scales tip the other way against that person that came in. So it's not so much, again, just innocence. It's that you have a balance and um, they they have to, of course, accept the, the judgment. If they don't accept the judgment, then you're never going to have a balance but this is the concept in Hebrew of, of deen, of law, is the sense that, again, that the scales, and they had that, they had that image in, in the ancient world. We had that, uh, and they had that as our image for, um, for judges, that there were scales and that the scales are even. By the way, I'll tell you, I'll show you an interesting, um, I'll show you an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting little thing for uh, a little interesting thing for one of the reasons why Jewish um, the Jewish zodiac sign um, it has a little bit to do with uh, what we're talking about here. Oh, sorry. Um, let me just get this out of the way. Hold it. Um, show this picture. So you know when um, you know when Rosh Hashanah is, right? What month is Rosh Hashanah usually in? It's usually September to October this year. This year it's coming up in October. That's right. So. Um, so I will show you. That's correct. But let's look at the Jewish Jewish zodiac sign for Tishrei is Libra, the scales. And that's the symbol for the scales and balance. The interesting thing about it from the Jewish standpoint was that, that we didn't invent the zodiac, the Greeks did. But what was interesting about the zodiac is that the symbol for Tishrei, for, for Libra, was the scales. Well, what's Rosh Hashanah called? It's Yom Hadin. It's the Day of Judgment. It's the day when God is supposed to level the playing field on a cosmic level, where everybody gets to start off fresh again, where the scales are, are like that. So if you look at different, you know, that's the scale, that's the symbol of it. But this is why we use this symbol and why we did it in the ancient world. So when we went to the... When we went to the um, when we went to the synagogues in the Galilee and see the zodiac symbol for the scales, that's one of the reasons why it was such a um, important symbol for that time of year for Tishrei. So the scales very important, and that is how we come to look at um, justice. So we do have the scales. It's not so much whether the woman holding him is blind or not, or has her has her her. Uh, her eyes uh, blinded or blindfolded, but um, the idea that the that the scales would be evened out is very important for us, and so um, it's very important that when they leave, they are there is a sense of justice. Space right now during this time that the scales are evened. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a big problem, and and it is a. It's, it's always a problem. As long as human beings are going to be responsible for administering justice, we're going to have a problem. But the question again is, do we give up on, on, the, on the hope that we have a justice system that will be fair, or do we uh, despair of it and say it's never going to work? Work sometimes. It doesn't always work. And it's painful when it doesn't work. But um, well, like you said, they're supposed to, a judge is really supposed to judge on 
on each case separately and not look at your past? Well, that's an interesting point. So then, you know, people get into the fact that in our system, we have a judge uh, in other uh, legal systems, including this legal system that the rabbis were in. They generally for a certain, almost every case had a tribunal, which means they had at least three judges. That's what the word tribunal means, right? Three judges. Um, and in cases of murder, they'd have, you know, 81 judges for, for those cases. Uh, so there were lots of judges. Uh, we have a jury system in this country, and, and sometimes the jury system, it's based on the idea of, of there being justice that a judge couldn't be bribed, or you wouldn't have a situation where, where again, a jury of your peers would, would give you better justice. But uh, mm -hmm. and if there's no jury, so it's a safe traffic court. Yeah. If the judge is standing before you and looks back in your past history, he's not supposed to do that. Look, he's supposed to be judging you on your individual. And also, if the officer doesn't show up, your your case is supposed to be dismissed. But if since it's an officer, they always postpone it and let the officer come in again. Listen, I will tell you that our our system is based on on people, right? And so, it's not, so it's not perfect. I, I will tell you, it's true, but I will also tell you this. Um, I will tell you this. If we ever go to a system where we're being judged by computers, people will not be happy with that either. So I don't know what the answer will be uh, as long as people, imperfect people are there. Uh, but we definitely have to aspire to do a much better job than what we're doing right now. I don't want to talk about, I want to talk about individual situations, but I will tell you uh, there, are, there have been a few times when I've been involved, especially, you know, when I've had to testify where I've looked out at the jury and say, I never want to have a jury of my peers because, because this is going to, this is not going to be good. But uh, yeah, it's not, it's, what are you going to do? You know, that's the system, but um, none of them are perfect. But this one was based on the fact that you had judges who would be impartial, had to be impartial, and would hopefully, again, having an odd number of judges and, and having a, um, you know, judges that were took their job very seriously, they were informed by a fear of heaven that they would be very careful in, in the administration of justice. Hey, guess what? That's why they have people still swear on a Bible. Well, they don't do that anymore, but... Why they used to have people swear in the Bible, the fear of God. So uh, that's what uh, Judah's saying was. And the next one was also about the legal system, if you will, which is um, Shimon ben Shatach used to say, be thorough in the interrogation of witnesses, be careful in, with your words, lest from them they learn to lie. Um that's kind of not three because that's really based on the second part. Um, and that is again, for the judges, make sure that um, because the, the lawyer's job in those days, wasn't necessarily to ask the witnesses questions. The judge's job was there to present the, the, the sides of the, the different parties, their, 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 their sides of the situation interrogation of the witnesses actually came down to the judges themselves, to the rabbis. So they would ask the judge, they, the, the, as judges, they would ask the witnesses questions, which we really don't have in our system. We, 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 we put the, the responsibility on the judges, right? I mean, the uh, attorneys to ask the questions. In, 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 in this system, the, the, the judges would ask the questions and um, the responsibility was, again, not to lead the witnesses, and you can easily do that. Because if you say certain things to them, then they will start giving false testimony. They'll learn, they'll, 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 they'll see what you're doing, and they'll be prompted to lie, to give false witness. That's the word, it says, il me du le shaker. That is the exact thing in the Ten Commandments where it says to give false witness, to give false testimony. They will be learning to, 
or they'll be led to, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be conditioned by your, by your direction to lie. And so as a, as a person cross-examining them, you can get them to um, go off into the direction of lying. And that, that's on you. That's a responsibility from you. So these uh, ones were definitely, uh, uh, and we've seen a couple, we've seen a few that have to do with the responsibility of the rabbis as judges. Um, you'll see some of those pop up later too, but, but these definitely come together there. Let's look at the next pair, because we're going to read a couple more pairs here today for sure. But this one right here is, a, a, is we're starting to get into people that we actually know a little bit about. Well, we might know about these people. These are people that, for example, Josephus, we think he starts writing about these people, uh, these two, Shemaiah and Abtalion. Uh, this is a generation from around this time is around the time of about Julius Caesar. This is right around the time of King Herod the Great. And so we know a little bit about these guys. And we actually know that these people, Shemaiah and Abtalion, we believe actually, were in opposition to King Herod. And King Herod could have actually killed them, but he didn't. Maybe because they were a little too powerful or they were a little too, they wanted to make them martyrs. Well, let's see what they said. Let's see what these guys said. Because we don't know for sure if they're if they're the same people that, that were mentioned in Josephus, but you'll see why we know they're pretty important. So here's what they said. Shemaiah and Abte Talion, they received it from those guys, right? From from uh, from Shimon and and uh, and Judah, Judah ben Tabai. It says Shemaiah used to say, "Love work, hate acting like the superior, and do not attempt to draw near." to the ruling authority. That is the first situation. And we believe, based on what we know about, about these guys and when they were, were writing, if they were writing around the time of King Herod the Great, he has a good reason to say, stay away from the authority, because King Herod the Great was not so great, at least as a person. As a builder, he was very great. But as a person, as a as a Jew, as, as a person of moral consequence, he was one of the worst human beings around. And so when it says stay away from the reshut, the, the, ruling, the rulers, the people of authority, definitely if this is the same time, which we believe, there's a good reason why he says that. These are not good people to be around. Uh, King Herod was very close to the Romans. I will tell you that there are other lines of the Pirkei that contradict that line we just read. Could be a different time. Could be a different authority at the time. So maybe they weren't so scared. But let's just take this into context of, you know, King Herod, but maybe even wider, wider out, which is how much do we trust the political leaders around us? Do we, do we get too close to them? And will we be compromised by them? Um, the other stuff here, I think, is pretty, pretty good, right? Uh, I don't think anyone could argue with these. Love work, right? Love your work. Oh, have it, malha, You know, it doesn't say what work, what kind of work, whatever work you're doing, you should love it. Uh, and not liking, so. You will have something, you love this, and then, of course, the construct for it is sanah, hate. So love on one side. So he's kind of being clever. Love this, hate this. Hate trying to be like this. Now, what's interesting about it is if you look at it, right, The, the literal phrase, hate the Rabbanut, somebody could take that out of somebody could take that out of context and say, hate the rabbinical authorities. That's what Rabbanut means. 
Now they translated it probably with the intention of it, which is don't walk around acting like you're an authority or, you know, hate that kind of behavior. Hate the kind of behavior where people think that they're better than other people. So that does seem to be the context of it. But there is this kind of understanding that maybe what he's saying is, it's great to be a rabbi, it's great to do the work, but don't try to be part of the leadership, and don't try to be close to the political leadership either. So this is definitely a threefold thing. What should you like to do? The work. Don't necessarily try to be part of the ruling authority. Now, there's no ruling authority of within the rabbinic context anymore, or at least for most of us. We're in a, if we're in an ultra-Orthodox situation, there definitely is. But the last one, assuming that it has to do with the ruling authority, to stay away from that, um, stay away from that, talking more about the political authority. But it's interesting that as a rabbi, what do these, what do these principles mean? Love what you do, but don't do it so that you get to have more power. Don't do it so you get to be part of the rabbinic class, if you will. And definitely don't use that as a chance to um, be closer to the political authority. Don't use it to ingratiate yourself to get into the um, to that. Uh, from On a personal level, I definitely try to live like this. Try to love the work. Try not to be part of the rabbinic authority. There, like I said, there isn't really rabbinic authority anymore, but I have no desire to be part of rabbinic groups that make pronouncements over things or to... I, I'm not a part of any rabbinic group. I don't like signing letters on behalf of, as rabbis. Uh, I very rarely do it. It's got to be something so obvious and so like straightforward that it's a no-brainer. Um, I'm a little bit guilty of the last one, though, which is I sometimes have been too close to the ruling authority. And it's, it is a, it is a, a very interesting, I will weigh in on this. I will comment on this. Joanne, which is there's a very fine line between um, being close to the political leaders and being drawn into the, um, you know, endorsing and, and being too close to these people as friends. Now, today, there's only so much that we can do. It's not like being a rabbi or is going to get a lot done on a political, on political standpoint, but having relationships and being able to speak to the people on the city council, for example, or the mayor or whoever, the, the, the congressperson is important. I mean, we, we cultivate those relationships. That's one of the things we do through APAC and through other, you know, through, well, yeah, but, but the, but, the, but it's a fine line because you have to keep a relationship with them, but you also have to be careful that you um, aren't too close. And and that that is a, that is a it is a difficult it's a difficult thing and again it's important to kind of think about this of not being too close to anybody that that you're compromised politically. Look, I I, I think one of the best examples of this is that um, people for for good reasons, you know, had political relationships uh, as rabbis and they did a disservice to the Jewish community. I mean. I don't want to bash somebody who's been dead for 40 years, but, you know, Stephen S. Wise, you know, told American Jews to get off of FDR's case. And he, you know, he, from what we know, he lobbied FDR to try to save the Jews of Europe, but he didn't, wasn't successful. And if I were him, and again, it's easy to speak about someone who's been dead for 50 years, I would, I would have said, look, FDR, I gave you a chance. And I've said this to political leaders before. I've given you a chance. I spoke to you one on one. I didn't do this in, in in public, but now that you have not done the right thing, I'm I'm going to hold you accountable. And he didn't do it. I think he believed what FDR told him, which was that 
you know, we'll we'll save the Jews when by def by defeating the Nazis. But he was wrong. So it's easy to say that now, I know. But looking back on it, there were not enough rabbinic leaders at the time who were holding them authority. You know, uh, uh, uh. I, I think, think they were. I think they were to some extent so drawn into it. I understand, but that's not the point. The point is, is that he had a relationship with him, and he didn't use it to, to, you know, to some extent. It, everybody knew he was friends with him, and if he had come out and said, "I'm done with you because you're not saving my people," that would have had. I don't know if it would have done anything, but I know that he didn't do anything by 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 fawning over him and not and not holding him accountable. So, look again. It's easy for me to say that now. I didn't live then, but I would have hoped I would have not done what he did and again you know uh our our i've had discussions with political leaders and i've said to them this is what you got to do and if you don't do it i'm going to embarrass you and i've done that before uh and i've done it You're holding them accountable. yeah but but i'm also I, I i'm doing it because i believe it's the right thing to do and i don't care if they hate me or i don't care if it ruins my relationship with them so i don't i don't follow this too careful, but it's a, it's a soft, you have to have a, it's a, it's an interesting dance because again, if you, if you are seen as, as endorsing one party or one, or one person, then you can really get into a problem because then when the next party's in power, then they dismiss you and they won't, you won't have any say in that. So it's, it's a very important uh, situation. And it's one that I do think about because I want to be able to be a, an advocate for Israel, for example, and I don't want to turn this into a partisan issue. So if I tell people, well, only Republicans are defending Israel right now, that doesn't do anything. And it's not going to help me if the next congressperson for Santa Clarita is a, is a, is a Democrat. I'm, I'm going to dis I'm going to have a bad relationship with that person. So, you know, that's all I can tell you is that I do think about this last part, this third thing all the time, which is, I think the biggest thing and the cautionary tale to this is don't get sucked up into it. Don't think because you have a relationship with a political leader that, you know, so what? If if it doesn't help, if it doesn't help our agenda, which is to help the Jewish community, to help Israel, who cares? What's I'm friends with a congressperson, big deal. So that is my point. That's what I try to do. But I try not to get sucked into the, you know, oh, you're friends with so and so doesn't matter if they if if they're not gonna if they're not gonna deliver then I don't care so I will tell you that's a cautionary tale but it's also again it's very seductive people who have those kinds of relationships with with political leaders you know everybody wants to be asked to to give an invocation at the at the capitol you know but what do you have to do in order to to get that um you know it, it's uh it's it's seductive, but it, and that's the warning for this is don't don't get sucked into that. I I I was asked once by a friend and political a political leader to do something that I really wasn't wasn't I was kind of on the fence about it, so it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal. But I was asked to write a letter on their behalf, and it wasn't wrong. But I do think that I don't I wouldn't have written a letter if I didn't have a relationship with the person. Wasn't it? It wasn't a big thing, and I can't get into. It. I don't want to get into it. The person's still alive, and, it, and the situation is kind of stupid in a way. It wasn't that big of a deal, but the person had done a lot of stuff for the Jewish community. I don't know if it was because of my relationship or because the person had done a lot for the Jewish community. But um, yeah, these are big issues. Definitely, there's a fine line here, and that's why it's here. And it is every three of every one of those three things is as relevant today as it was two thousand years ago when the political leaders were really bad. So as bad as you think political leaders are today, we got no Herod the Great. We have people that might aspire to be Herod the Great, but they're not Herod the Great, trust me. Because Herod the Great killed his own family, he killed two of his sons. And there might be people who would like to kill their sons, but there's nobody who's done it that we're potentially voting for right now. And there's definitely people who have uh, not been happy with their sons at different times, but they have not killed them, at least as of now. King Herod the Great killed them. He killed two of his sons. There's a very famous saying that the Romans had about King Herod. It was safer to be his pig than his son. Because they knew he didn't eat pork. 
wouldn't kill a pig, but he did kill his sons. So yeah, he was a, he was a, he was a piece of work. Um, now that's Shemaiah. Let's look at what Ab Talion said. And again, uh, similar time, similar maybe framework of context. Sages, be careful with your words, lest you incur the penalty of exile and be carried off to a place of evil waters. And the disciples who follow you drink and die, and thus the name of heaven becomes profaned. Now, all of those things, those that chain of events, seems to be predicated on not being careful with what you said, getting yourself in trouble, and winding up being exiled. Now, who would exile you? Well, could be the Romans. Could be the Romans, but the Romans would just as soon just kill you. They didn't really worry about exiling a Jew. First of all, they didn't, they didn't really think about things in those terms because the Romans could live anywhere and they didn't care. It was all part of Rome. For Jews to live in the land of Israel, though, that was something special. Not every Jew lived in Israel by this time, right? By this time, the Greco-Roman period, the majority of Jews didn't live in Israel. But, but living in Israel and then being exiled would have been something really bad. And so what they're talking about here is definitely a situation where the person was exiled by his own people, either by King Herod and that government, which was there under the blessing of the Romans, but King Herod had power over his own area, or it's the rabbis themselves who could exile somebody. The rabbis at that time probably had the power to exile people, at least out of, maybe not out of Israel itself, but out of the areas that were controlled by, by the Jewish community. Because not all of the cities of Israel at the time were even controlled by the Jews. Beit Shan, Scythopolis, that we go to all the time, was a Roman city. It was not a Jewish city inside Israel. And so being exiled might mean that you can't live in most of Israel, but there might be places you could live, but you wouldn't be able to go to Jerusalem. So exile would oftentimes lead to places where you would become no longer connected to good things, where they called a place of evil waters. And they're not, they're not talking here about bad water. They're not talking about, you know, poison. They're talking about they're talking about your followers, your students, ending up going off in the wrong direction. And what would happen is, is then it's a, it's a disaster for God. It's a disaster for our religion if you become um, exiled, if you become part of um, the wrong side, part of, again, a group that would then be cut off from the people. And so it would affect you, it would affect your dis disciples, it would affect your Talmudim, that's your students, right? And uh, this is, the consequences are severe. And so this is a serious thing. And it, it's a warning for the rabbis, don't get yourself in trouble. And so it gets back to what we had before, which is don't, you know, be very careful of the, of the authorities, because if they can send you away, it's not just you. It's your students that will be affected by this too. You're, you're, you have a responsibility to your community. So again, this is a context, a historical context, which sometimes hard for us to imagine, but it was something that we dealt with for a long time. And there are Jews today that if they're in a rabbinic Orthodox, you know, ultra-Orthodox community, they can be exiled from that community. And if they do, it's very serious for their families. If they have students, they also, if they're a rabbi who has students, they can also be exiled and the, it affects the students as well. So it does affect some Jews today. It has happened where groups have split off from each other and have been essentially, the groups have been excommunicated and it it happens, but it doesn't. It's not something that we are in at all. But it happens, and in, in, it's happened in the Satmar community, as we saw in recent days. There are definitely groups within Chabad that are becoming very close to being excommunicated, 
And so it, there is definitely tension in, in some groups that we that we see, but we don't see it. We, we, we don't experience it in our in the non-orthodox world. We are, we're not. And even I don't mean in the non-ultra orthodox world, we won't see this. But it, yeah, sometimes groups get, get exiled and get excommunicated, not just a rabbi or not just one person, but a group of people will all get excommunicated together. And there'll be, um, there's a consequence to that. So definitely be careful of your responsibility. And that's what it says, right? It says, hachamim, sages. That's why it's translated sages. They're definitely rabbis, but these are rabbis that have reached a level of, of being respected, a respected leader. Now, Abtal Yon and, and Shemaiah are well-known, maybe, or maybe we think that they're, rel they're related in, in some texts. We're not 100% sure. Shemaiah, definitely the name comes out. The name Abtal Yon doesn't come out, but the name Polion comes out, which is a perhaps a Greek version of that. We do have references, uh, again, to a Rabbi Polion, who was very po powerful in this time, and we think that might be Abtal Yon. The next guys who study with these people, we know very well. Hillel and Shammai received the oral tradition from them. And there we have Hillel and Shammai. Now, the reason why we, we're not 100% sure that the reference to Shammaiah is that Shammaiah, or is it this guy, Shammai? Because it's the same, it's the same kind of name. So we're not 100% sure. But Shammai and Hillel were a pair. And we know them very well from the rabbinic uh, literature in that they were uh, schools of, of thought. They, they created separate approaches and separate schools of how to understand the Torah. So they were teachers who were rivals. We oftentimes juxtapose them in the, in, the, in the Talmud against each other. We don't know that they didn't like each other, but their students didn't like each other. We know that. Their students did not get along. And we know that they had different approaches. We normally follow the rules of Hillel in most cases. But Shammai's judgments and decisions are all kept. Not all kept, but a lot of them are kept. Many of them are kept. And, and so what it tells us is that even though we don't often follow Shammai's um, answers, we kept them. And we can learn from them, and we should know that there are other approaches and other logical um, ways of, of looking at things that we should not we should not forget. And so the rabbis were very, very, and again, that's what's in the Talmud, very careful to make sure that we did not lose opinions that are contrary to maybe what the normal answer is that those other answers should be out there because we can learn from them, and maybe there's a logic to them. As we've said before, one of the best examples of Hillel and Shammai's differences, Hanukkah candles. Yeah. Right? Hillel had us add, add one every night. Well, that's what we do, because it's Rabbi Hillel. You follow his ways. Shammai, you started with eight, and you took one down every night. Now, Shammai's answer is a good answer, right? Every day... There was a little less light because there was less oil. The oil got eaten up, but it didn't get eaten up as fast as it was supposed to. But the oil did go down. Yes, and there's no schools called Shammai. Yeah, well, we're going to look at that because Shammai, we're going to look at why we take Hillel's answers. But it's important to know that Shammai is still respected. He's still talked about. And even though we don't follow his rules a lot, we follow and respect and, and acknowledge those differences of opinion. And to some extent, if you think about it, if we don't know what the other sides were saying or the other approaches, we don't really understand how we arrived at the decisions that we have. And so it's really important to see those decisions, to see... Uh, to see what the other side might be, because it helps us understand why we follow the way we do. 
it helps us understand the logic of it. Well, because this is the way we came to this conclusion, but what are the other considerations here? And so it really does help us be educated. Yeah. And it's why one of the important things we think about in Judaism is, is we study these things because we learn from them and we learn from the answers that were not necessarily the answer that we follow. We still learn from it because there's a truth there. And that's one of the things that we um, like to tell people that Hillel and Shammai argued, according to the Talmud, about everything. Any way you could read something, they, they read it differently from each other. But we kept those discussions. We kept those arguments. Why? Because those were the arguments, the Shem Shemaim, for the sake of heaven. Those were arguments that were had important consequences, and we wanted people to know why we do what we do. The, the example of the opposite was the discussion of Korach. We hear in the Bible about Korach in Numbers, and they argue, he argued against Moses. He rebelled against Moses, but we don't really know what prompted it. It just says he rebelled against them. He spoke out against Moses and said, you know, why is Moses any better than all? But we don't know what prompted it. We don't know what the argument is about. The, the Torah doesn't tell us. And the rabbis say, we learn from that. We didn't keep that argument because it was not L'Shem Shemaim. It was about something stupid that nobody should have been arguing about. And we don't keep those. But arguments, machlochet, are a dispute for the sake of heaven. We keep that and will not forget it. And we have those arguments in our society today, and it's important for us to see those arguments and to see them in, in front of us and to learn from them, and not to think that we can't learn from both sides. And that's a really important idea, too, that we have to remember, because we tend to, like, we're, we've gotten to a situation where we don't want to even hear from the other side anymore. We don't want to hear the truth that somebody else might have. And the problem is, is that we're losing this ability that we had for years. For, for us, for thousands of years as Jews, we've said, there might be another side to this. And that's why... Um, if you're a Jew, there's always another side. <laughs> yes. And we got to remember those sides. We have to remember those sides and learn from them. Not, you know, not... If you, if you didn't keep it, if you don't write it down, then how will anyone ever know? And so here's what Hillel says. This is, you'll see why we love Hillel. We have a lot more quotes from Hillel. So here's the first one, though, that he gives us. Hillel used to say, be disciples of Aaron. Love peace, pursue peace. Loving mankind and drawing them close to the Torah. Now, we assume that these are principles of Aaron, right? These are principles of Moses' brother, the first priest. He loved peace, chased peace, pursued peace, right? And loved human beings and bring them close to Torah. Hillel was not a Kohen. And for him to give this credit to the priests, it's pretty significant. Because here we get to, and maybe it's not all the priests, but it's to be like Aaron. And what do we know about Aaron? Not a lot, by the way. We don't know a lot about why Aaron was such a great brother to Moses. But this tells us that he, he had these qualities. He loved peace. He wanted people to get along, right? Maybe that's why he did the golden calf. He didn't want a golden calf, but he didn't want people to kill each other. So... I'm going to I'm going to stop people from killing each other. I'm going to create peace by building a golden calf. Maybe it wasn't the greatest decision, but it was based on an idea of of trying to get everybody calmed down. And of course, it's not just loving peace, but it's chasing after peace, it's pursuing peace. Rodef means to pursue it. Almost like a almost like a killer, almost like a stalker. I can't just assume that I'm going to have peace. I'm going to chase after it. I'm going to go after it. That's what pursuing peace, that's why it uses the word pursue. Pursue, Rodev Shalom. Their synagogue's called Rodev Shalom. Road faith, road, sometimes Rod Fate Zedek, to chase justice, to chase peace. But it means that it takes work. It doesn't mean that it's going to fall into our laps. It doesn't mean that peace is easy, that it's out there. We have to chase after it. We have to pursue it. And that's what he did. And so 
loving peace and chasing peace. And then it says loving humankind, which could also be loving creation. Briut could be all of creation, be all of the stuff that, that's made. Let's say people, but humankind, God's creations. And it's definitely, you know, some type of human, but because it's not just loving them, it's bringing them to Torah. So loving peace, chasing after peace, loving people, and then, of course, bringing them to Torah. Because it's not just enough to love them. You also have to give them, you have to bring them close to the Torah. And so we have so many stories in the Talmud, examples. We have a whole set of stories about how converts, potential converts would come to Shammai and he chased them away, right, with a ruler. So he literally had a stick in his hand, a measuring rod, he would chase them away. And they would come to, to Hillel and he would teach them. And again, the famous one is, you know, the guy said, I want to learn the whole Torah standing, well, standing on one foot. And, and But it wasn't just that story. There are other stories of the converts that would come to Shammai and, and Hillel would, would be always accepting of them and bringing them and trying to make them feel at home in Judaism. And so this is a really important idea, drawing people close to Torah. It doesn't say Jews. It doesn't say, that's for sure. It doesn't say Jews. It doesn't say Israel. It doesn't say Yehudim. It doesn't say Hebrews. It doesn't say Israelites. It says creation. It says the people, humankind. Every person should be able to be drawn into Torah. So this is why, again, this concept is so important for us to be like Aaron and to be somebody who loves peace, who chases after peace, who tries to love humankind and bring them close to Torah. So it's not enough just to love it. It's not just enough to love people. It's not just enough to, uh, to love peace. We have to do something. We have to do something for peace. We have to do something for human beings. So it also requires action. It's not just love. It's also action. So this is what uh, Hillel gives us. And again, this is why Hillel is, is seen as such a great role model and why he was the ancestor of this dynasty. But we don't know a lot about Hillel. According to tradition, he was born in Babylonia. He was born in Iraq and moved to Israel. He's one of the first people that we call rabbi. Right. And so there is there is an understanding that maybe Hillel was, um, you know, kind of somebody who really brought the rabbinic tradition into um, into a forefront. We we I'll just show you um, a little bit about the little piece of, of Hillel. Um, we sometimes, again, call him Hillel the Elder because there were other Hillels that came about after him, but that he is the founder of the school or the Bait Hillel, the, the house of Hillel. We're going to get to his sayings in a second, don't worry. But according to this, he was born in Babylon. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, right, on one side and the tribe of David on the other, which means he's a descendant of of the kings, but also from the tribe of Benjamin, right? Josephus talks about his great-grandson, Shimon ben Gamliel, um, and Rabban Gamliel. That's the guy who gave us that famous line for Passover that we're supposed to learn about the, the Pesach Matzah Maror. It's all part of this family, right? Um, we don't know much about him, uh, but we do know, based on the time period, that he lived during the time of King Herod and Emperor Augustus. And it says there's a midrash that he was very much like Moses. Right? He, he, he went to the land of Israel, spent 40 years in study, and then, uh, so he was 40 when he moved to Israel, spent 40 years studying in Israel, and the last 40 years as the head rabbi, as the head of the rabbinical council, if you will. Um, but again, that's probably a, a rabbinic midrash on, on how old he was when he attained this kind of power. But the idea that he didn't grow up in Israel is pretty, pretty significant. That's why some people call him Hillel the Babylonian, because that's where he came from. But it shows that there, was, there were people moving back and forth between the communities back in those days. So um, we're going to get into, uh, again, the fact that he lived 120 years, 
some of the th stuff. Uh, and it says that Hillel's primary rival, his adversary was Shammai. So they would teach the same stuff, but they would teach different lessons from it. Well, let's take a look at his most famous saying. Oh, let's get to this one first. Yeah, there's, I forgot, there's one before the famous one. He also used to say, one who makes his name great causes his name to be destroyed. One who does not add to his knowledge causes it to cease. One who does not study the Torah deserves death. One who makes unworthy use of the crown of learning shall pass away. Now, these definitely seem to be overly excessive sayings. They're definitely major sayings of, of kind of like, you know, don't do this, do that. You know, if you do this, this is going to happen. There's definitely an understanding here of kind of extremes. Um, but this understanding here is that we um, we have to be very careful with our time here. Um, and we have to be very careful in how we act in this world. And one of the things that he stresses, like some of the stuff we've already read, don't try to be a big shot. Because if you try to be a big shot, you're going to wind up being nothing. And so um, this is something that he, uh, again, these phrases, I have to say, are more uh, poetic than they necessarily are, than they necessarily, uh, than they necessarily are like ultimate truths. I want to be careful as I say that because, um, you don't hear it in the English. I'll read it to you in Hebrew, and you'll hear it in the Hebrew, because it rhymes. So it says, Naged Shema Aved Shema. Shema. But it's 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 uh it's it's a it's a play on um it's a play on the word shem. Um uh, you just hear the rhyme. Udalo mosif, yasef, udalo yalef, katle chayav. So here he's rhyming the word yalef with mosif or yasif. It's it's a rhyming pattern. And it's uh it's not meant, well, I don't know, it's not meant. It's also it, it's supposed to be poetic. It's supposed to be um it's supposed to be um, a play on words, but again, the intention here is take your take your life seriously, right? Now, this is not like what Hillel's not best known for these kinds of sayings, but he did say them. There's another one we're going to read that you're going to be like, well, that doesn't seem very necessarily compassionate, but this next one is very compassionate. And it's very famous, which is Uhaya Omer, Im Ain Anili Mili, which sounds a whole lot better in Hebrew. And so this is the most famous quote of Hillel. But it also rhymes, Im Ain Anili Mili. If I'm not for myself, who is for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So it's a threefold scene. And um, the first two obviously play off of each other, right? In Aina Neely Mealy, right? If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? I can't expect anybody to, 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 to uh, advocate for me if I don't advocate for myself. But if I'm only for myself, what am I? Ma'ani, which is a rhetorical question. It's a question, but it's a rhetorical question. We know that what are you if you're only for yourself, right? And then the last part, you think kind of applies to that, but it, it also applies to kind of everything, which is if not now, when? So this is a really important idea which 
we could say is a Jewish principle. It's been used by people throughout time to finally get people to do the right thing. Um, just to advocate for people to say enough is enough. Um, well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to his golden rule because he has a golden rule too. 100% he has a golden rule. But this is the most famous part of what he said because he does have a he has a formulation of the golden rule a very famous one this one is the most famous of what he said because to some extent his formulation of a golden rule is already in the bible which is you know the famous kamocha is what the torah says love your neighbors yourself and he reformulates it right as what is hateful to you don't do to other people but he, he's reframing what was in the torah this is not in the torah as a as a line that you can say, oh, this is where the Torah says this, but the Torah definitely teaches this. But this is one of those eternal truths that is as true today as it was 2,000 years ago, which is how do we balance on an individual level our needs with other people's needs? How do we do that as a community, right? This is the answer that we oftentimes are faced with, you know, in the Jewish community, right? If we don't protect ourselves, who's going to protect us, right? But if we only think about ourselves, what are we as a community? So this is not just for the individual. This is for our community. And of course, the last principle also for ourselves and for our community. If not now, when? when, when, when I mean, th that by itself could be the whole saying, right? If not now, when? So it's a very powerful phrase. The two phrases have to go together, though. You can't just say, if I am not for myself, who will be for me, without saying the next line. But if I'm only for myself, what am I? The, the lines only work together. The last line could go anywhere, any, to, any place. But the other two have to go together. And they rhyme. It's me, mani. It, it sounds much better in Hebrew than it does in English. But it's a very powerful idea. It's one that we, uh, again, Hillel is most known for this. And it's been put to music, and it's been people have sung versions of this. Uh, but it, it's, it's not great. It's not like it's not like some of the other ones that are that are uh, been put to music, but um, so that's what he says. Now it's going to go to a Shemai line, and it's not. But that's not the end of Hill. Let me. I'll show you why. Shemai used to say, "Make your study of Torah a fixed practice. Speak little, but do much." and receive all men with a pleasant countenance. So he has three things. Any of those lines could actually be taken out of context. They don't need, you don't need the previous line to have the next line, right? Those are three of things he says. And the next line then goes to Rabban Gamliel. But I want to point out that um, uh, Shammai, it seems like a at least based on the lines that we just read from Hillel and the lines from Shammai, seem pretty much even when it comes to niceness. To to, I mean, Shammai says, "Receive all people with a pleasant." Uh, no, no, no. That's the translation. It says "kol adam." It says "all of humanity." The bad translation. Why? Well, yeah, but, but there's no reason. There's no reason why. Well, there's definitely we got one line from Shammai and a bunch of lines from Hillel, and this isn't the end of Hillel. But uh, the the they chose to pick, assuming that Hillel's great 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 grandson Rabbi Judah Hanasi is the one who five greats six greats was the one who edited this two hundred years later. He he doesn't. Make Shemaiah look bad. 
Now, look, nobody looks bad in this. Every every one of the rabbi's lines was there because they liked the line. So yes, John, they're 100% cherry picking. But I don't know, reading Hillel and Shammai next to each other, Shammai just said, if you don't learn, you should die. <laughs> this one seems This one seems a little bit like there, there's nothing bad here. And it goes against what we know about Shammai elsewhere in the Bible, because I mean, in the Talmud, because Shammai chases people away. Here it says, receive all men with a pleasant countenance. That doesn't seem to be what the Talmud at least recounts he does. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it. But it says that you're supposed, he says you're supposed to do that. Uh, he also says, make sure your Torah is a fixed practice. That is what he says now, which is why Wednesday, seven o'clock, Tuesday morning, nine o'clock. We don't just say, hey, we're going to do it sometime. We're going to do it when we can do it. You have to make it a time, which is what a kiva means. It means a set time. It means a intentional thing, a discipline. Well, Mondays and Thursdays, right, were days that people normally study Torah because those were market days. It wasn't like those days were inherently better days. The reason that they were made days of study and days of 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 coming to shul was because those were the days that people were already in town. And so if they were in town, we do it when they're in town. That was the the logic behind it. We don't have market days anymore, so it doesn't really make sense. But back in the day when there were farmers markets and that was the only market, the markets weren't set up every day, right? We might be getting to that one day ourselves. I'm not kidding. I mean, we're getting very close to having malls that would only be open one day a week. I mean, I think there's a lot of store uh, independent uh, shopkeepers that would like that. In the U.S. Yeah. In Australia, it's completely. I understand. But in our country, yeah, in our country, we've got malls that are empty. And it's partly because the malls require the people to be open, you know, you, you sign a lease here, you got to be open 11 till 8. They can't be because they're not always busy. So it's a tough one, but that's the rule. That's the rule of the mall. Yeah, I know. But whatever the rule is, the rule of you having to keep your store open for those hours is, it's 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 tough on people. It's more, I think it's tougher because of online shopping. Yeah, well, there's no question that that's what's done it, but how you deal with it is by probably creating market days, days when people who want to come out in, into public and want to have that experience, which there are people. But yeah, every day people come into to a, a shopping mall, it ain't working. So how did you decide on Tuesday and Wednesday? Uh, way back when, we started on Wednesdays because it was, it was a day that very rarely will there be holidays on Wednesdays. I don't mean it's never the case, but Wednesdays is pretty much people are are not traveling on those days. Fridays and Mondays, Friday we really couldn't do it because of services, but it gave enough time away. Tuesdays, I think we added because that's when people was also staying away from Mondays, was that that was a day that people could um who couldn't come to Wednesdays. That's why we added Tuesdays was for people who couldn't come to Wednesdays. We added the Tuesdays about six years later, five years later. Correct. But some people couldn't come on Wednesday nights. That's why we started the Tuesdays. Fine. But, but you think that, Yes. but that's not why it started. Tuesday morning started for, I mean, I'm going to tell you because John asked a fair question and it's not a legend. It happened 20 years. It's actually 20 years. So we've been doing Wednesday nights from the very beginning, from the moment I got here. But so it's 23, 24 years ago. The, the, geez, it keeps getting, yeah, it's now it's 2024. So I can say that. But uh, in 2004, we had uh, adult B'nai Mitzvah classes where the we we required that Wednesday nights that that the people who are going through the Wednesday nights, uh, the adult B'nai Mitzvah had to come Wednesday nights. It still is. You did that right, right in church. Correct, yeah. but because that was when it first started, we didn't have Tuesdays, and so some of the people who are in the bar, the mainly bat mitzvah, but there were some bar, always some bar mitzvahs, because those people didn't couldn't come Wednesdays, they asked if we could do a Tuesday, and that's why we started Tuesday. 
was because the Wednesday and most of those people were not retired. They were, they were moms primarily who had an easier time coming who didn't work. Well, who worked at home. They worked hard at home. So yes, they did not have a job during the morning that they had to be at. They did not have a job outside of the house where they had to be there, but that's why it started. And that is the truth. It's not a bubble mice. That's the way it started. So you'd think it was the other way around, but it wasn't. It wasn't the retired people that we started the Tuesday morning. Well, yes, I thought that possibly because... It's logical you'd think that. That's not what happened. So anyways, that is the fix, fixed practice. It, it's, it should be able to be disciplined to do it. And, and I'm... And I'm and I'm as much, I would be as guilty of that as, as anybody. If I didn't have the responsibility of studying, I would put it off and, and not do it. Just like I would put off not exercising. If I didn't have a responsibility to do it, I wouldn't do it. So it needs to be fixed. It needs to be a responsibility. And again, we are going to get to some of the other sayings about it. But the understanding that study is important is something that... Um, the rabbis definitely leave. Uh, Shammai also says this line that we have a version of it to speak little but do much, right? We always think about Teddy Roosevelt, right? So it's, it's clear to say that Rabbi Shammai and, and Yeshua were buried in heaven. Oh, yeah. Shammai. Our day. Yeah, Shammai is a, Shammai is a, uh, he's not the only person that's going to talk about that. Look, Hilo said, I mean, I could make the argument that Hillel really influenced me because somebody who doesn't study Torah deserves death. I'm only going to tell you, Shammai, Shammai, Shammai might have made me more. No, but but the reality is, is that if you thought about it, Shammai comes across looking just positively uh, gentle compared to to Hillel in that because he says you need to make it a study of you need to make it fixed practice. Um, but speak little, do much is definitely the Teddy Roosevelt, you know. Talk softly, but carry a big stick. And I love that. I love the love that version of it too. But um, but Shammai is also one that, again, stressing your 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 actions and not what you talk about. You know, and then receiving all people with pleasant countenance. Again, panim uh, yafot with a with a with a pleasant face. Uh, you may not feel that at the time. You may not. You may not be in a good mood. Uh, and you may not, um, you may not be feeling it, but your outward expression should at least be one of pleasant, uh, to be pleasant when you meet someone, um, when you receive them, right? When you start talking, may not, may not have that feeling by the end of the conversation. <laughs> he doesn't say that. I mean, I'm assuming you should always have a, try to have a pleasant countenance, but at least when you start with them, when you, they come to you, uh, bes be Besever, as he says, at the beginning, when they start coming, when they come into you and they start talking with you, at least start off in a, in a, in a, in a pleasant way. And as I said, we don't get that from the text uh, always about Shammai. So that's, and, and again, um, we're not, we're, we're going to, you know, maybe we'll read a couple more, but, but I'm going to show you, um, uh, Hillel is, is coming back here. Right? Hillel's coming back. This is all Hillel. This is all Hillel. More Hillel. We're going to get to some great Hillels. I love this one. More wives, more witchcraft. Yeah, I'm not going to skip this. I just want you to know more wives, more witchcraft. Just think about that. That's, um, we won't get to that. But yeah, Hillel's not done. Hillel is not over. But I will say that, uh, uh, yeah, based on what we have, and again, we don't have a lot of Shammai. I'm also telling you that because, well, here you already have a few more lines of Hillel, right? We have, we have three sections of Hillel: the Aaron one, the won't be like Aaron. We have the, the threefold thing here, and then we have the the Anili Mili of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they, they, they went, they went against each other. So here, so here is. Um, here is some of the sayings of Hillel. Well, I don't want to get, I don't want to skip ahead, right? I don't want to skip ahead. I don't want to, I don't want to give too, uh, I don't want to give too much about, it. but yes, there are other two Hillels that came after him. Uh, and again, some people say that 
some of the sayings of Hillel were from them and not from the original Hillel. But uh, again, according to um, according to uh, our understandings, was that he had he studied with these two guys, Shammai and Ab Tal Yon. Uh, just to, by the way, to show you a little bit about Ab Tal Yon, again, we have a we have some legends about Ab Tal Yon. Uh, one of them, by the way, is that both Ab Tal Yon and Shemaiah were converts to Judaism or descendants of converts, right? And that they may have even, of course, according to the Talmud, be descendants of King Sanacharib, who was the destroyer of the northern kingdom. So the interesting thing about that is that maybe they were. Um, one of the great historians of the Jewish people of, of the, of the uh, previous century, Gratz, he said that maybe um, they weren't Gentile, but they were from Alexandria, from Egypt. So again, we don't know a lot about um, about these guys, Abtal Yon and, and uh, Shemaiah. We believe that maybe, again, this guy named Polion was uh, Abtal Yon, because he also mentions him along with a guy named Simaeus, who might be Shemaiah. But it could also be that Shemaiah is, uh, is Shammai. So we're not 100% sure. We're not 100% sure, but Josephus does talk about these guys and that they were around during the time of King Herod the Great. So we're not 100% sure that that's the same guy, but let's look real quick here too at, um, at uh, Hillel and that his rival, his rival, and we almost always talk about him with, together, is Shammai. So let's just look real quick at uh, that guy, Shammai. And this is a place that we believe um, Shammai might be buried in that same area in Tiberias, near Tiberias, Mount Meron, up there by Tiberias. And it says that, again, he lived during that time of about 50 BCE to 30, right? Um, so he was a contemporary of him. And... Uh, but again, there's some tradition that Hillel was older than him. We don't know for sure. But uh, let's just uh, show this one thing here. Um, uh, it says, once when a Gentile came to him to ask to be converted to Judaism uh, upon the condition of extreme brevity on one foot, Shammai said it was impossible and drove him away. Whereas Hillel rebuked him gently by saying, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is explanation. Go and learn. And the Gentiles subsequently converted. That is his version of the, of, the, of the golden rule. But of course, he doesn't say, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, what is hateful to you, don't do to other people. Um, well, I don't want to get into that today. We'll talk about that when we talk more about Hillel. But let's look at Shammai. This line that we have from him. Um, it says he was even modest towards his people. It, at a personal level, Shammai's religious views were known to be strict. He wished to make his son, while still a child, conform to law regarding fasting on Yom Kippur. He was dissuaded from his purpose only through the insistence of friends. Once when his daughter-in-law gave birth to a boy on Sukkot, he broke through the roof of the chamber in which she lay in order to make a sukkah out of it so the newborn grandchild might fulfill the religious obligation of the festival. So these legends about Shammai are basically that he was a stickler for the rules. Um, we don't know for a fact that this happened. There's definitely a feeling that his, his school, that his, his, um, his, uh, his approach was more strict. Um, we don't, again, we don't know for, we don't know for a fact we do have a, 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 a Moshav named after him in, uh, in Israel, but as you already pointed out, there are not a lot of things named after Shammai. There are a lot of things named after Hillel all over the place. You pointed it out. That's right. There's Temple Beth Hillel in North Hollywood. There's Beit Hillel all over the place. And there is a campus outreach at every college campus in America virtually. That's called Hillel, named after him. So we definitely admire Hillel. There's communities in Israel that are named after Hillel. There are streets named after Hillel. There's also streets named after Shammai in Jerusalem, but Hillel is definitely the person that we um, are most drawn to. 
And one of the things that we also know about Hillel is that the reason the Talmud says that we follow Hillel in most matters is because, again, the way he treated people. But according to the Talmud, in Hillel's school, they always taught the laws and the approach of Shammai in addition to their own, which from that we learn that what made Hillel a little different was not just his approach to the law, but his approach to teaching the law, which was, let's listen to both sides. And because he would teach Shammai's rules in addition to his own, we generally follow his because he was open to both sides. And, um, you know, it's interesting because if you tell an Orthodox rabbi, hey, look, don't you want to be like Rabbi Hillel instead of being like Shammai? They would say, yeah, but, you know, we, we, uh, we don't take a strict, what's called a machmir approach, just for the sake of, of being religiously observant. We do it because we want to make sure people don't break the law. Uh, and we don't want someone to wind up on the wrong side of, of God, if you will. And, and, and um, look, we, we understand that um, Hillel is a great, is a great um, example, but we also remember Shema. And, uh, and as I said, at least what we have in the, uh, in the Pirkei Avot, you wouldn't walk away from it thinking that Shammai was some kind of schnook. He's, he seems like a decent fellow. And um, every, everybody in the, everyone who's quoted. Yeah. Yeah. So again, Hillel and Shammai, while the terms liberal and conservative may not perfectly capture the nuances of their position, Hillel is generally considered the more lenient or flexible in his interpretations of Jewish law. So the interesting thing is, is you would actually say that all of Jewish law, to some extent, that follows Hillel is supposed to, to some extent, be a little bit more liberal, but um, it's not exactly that. And you definitely wouldn't tell people, you know, you got to rule more like Hillel and less like Shammai because it's just, it doesn't, nobody would say that Shammai was wrong. So um, I don't know. I, look, I've never been in an argument with an Orthodox person and said, well, I'm more like Hillel and you're more like Shammai. You know, I've never said that. But, um, you know, I, you have to be in that framework where you're arguing along rabbinic line to begin with, you know. And so if I'm in an argument with somebody about Jewish law, I might not be taking into consideration Jewish law alone. I might be taking into consideration science. I might be taking into consideration practicality in today's modern world. I can give you a lot of examples. I'm not going to give you one, but I, I would say maybe the idea of accepting patrilineal descent in 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 the world that we live in, you know, I I I think if if Hillel was living today, he would have accepted patrilineal descent. But I don't know. Who am I to say? I I I feel that way. But um, regardless, this is this is uh, all within the framework of Jewish law. You can't just say like I would. Yeah, but what about practicality from the standpoint of the society of the world we live in? Hillel never. I shouldn't say that. He very rarely. There are a couple of instances where he where he moved outside of Jewish law. Um, I will, as we wrap up, I will show you. Um, there was the time um, that Hillel uh, introduced decrees. Most famous as enactments was the Prose Bowl, an institution that in spite of the law concerning the cancellation of debts in the sabbatical year, ensured the repayment of loans. The motive was repair of the world, social order. And he basically said, we can't do the sabbatical year anymore. So he went against the Torah to some extent. He said, we're going to no longer have a remission of debts during the sabbatical year. So normally he worked within the rabbinic framework and he didn't, he didn't come up with his own decisions. Um, so um, there you go. So we will see y'all next Wednesday. Friday night. Oh, we see you Friday. Friday night. We're, 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 we're doing You're doing the Oneg.
Perfect. Is it good? Is it great? For those, for those, for those who aren't going to be here, uh, who aren't with us in person, come Friday night. Or if you're not, you can still come online. But you won't be able to taste the delicious food that Doreen and Joanne are bringing. Got from the marketing the balance. You already got it. You need to make sure. Uh oh! Don't you see? You shouldn't have said that. She, it's, she, it's not leftovers, but it is frozen. You shouldn't have said that. Now people are skeptical. They should be. Okay. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's good to have uh, some people here for uh, our first our first uh, time for this year of 2024. And we'll see you soon, everybody. We'll see you Friday, if not before. Thank you, not. Rabbi. Thank you, Thank you Rabbi. Right. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Rabbi. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.